the customer and us. Anyway, I'll cover that later, but let's let's get started. Uh, this number five started. Yes, yeah, uh, number five. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, sure. There you go. Okay, great. So uh, last time we talked about voltage drop calculations and went through a couple examples. And Thanks, Kevin. And I got a chance to um, show you a little bit of our synergy uh, system or software that you know, our engineers use to do, to do basic power flow analysis with and, again, voltage drop calculations. Um, but I figured today we can kind of um, tag along that topic and talk about voltage optimization. You know, kind of make, makes a little bit of sense. And plus, it's a core smart grid uh, application for utilities today. So just a word on that in terms of the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois has the largest voltage optimization project in the U.S., between the state, between uh, ComEd and Illinois, and or Ameren, Illinois, as, as the two utilities here. So, ComEd is going to end up um, rolling out voltage optimization about 3,000 circuits out of their 4,500 total that they have distribution circuits, and then Ameren, Illinois, will end up rolling voltage optimization about 1,000 circuits out of our 2,600. So, large, large number of feeders across the state will end up having voltage optimization on it. So what is voltage optimization is, is what we're going to talk about today, um, give you a chance to, to maybe ask questions and, and better understand what it means for us. And, and like I said, this application is becoming live every day almost on different circuits across our territory. So I figured I'd start with a basic concept, which is conservation voltage reduction. Um, from the name, conservation voltage reduction, we're trying to reduce the voltage to um, do some kind of a conversation, uh, conservation. Uh, this really um, started back in the 70s around the oil embargo. Uh, I wasn't born <laughs> around then, but many of you weren't <laughs> either. Um, but, but around that time, um, I think um, that DOD and, and other, other uh, folks were looking at ways to uh, reduce our dependence on, on, on imported oil, uh, basically. I had a daughter born that year. Oh, really? 73. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, so as you know, power plants use, use oil and, and other forms of, of, uh, of non-renewable or fossil fuel resource, resources. So the more we can do to, to reduce the amount of, of uh, fossil fuel we use at the time made sense for the country overall, uh, which meant probably reducing the dependence on, on imported stuff. So that's when it started, and a lot of utilities start looking at implementing some form of a conservation voltage reduction as an energy efficiency measure. So CDR is concerned with really reducing the voltage delivered to the end customer, while you continue to meet the ANSI code and the state regulatory standards for, for voltage delivery range. And, and that would end up, you know, in theory, in reducing the energy consumption. Now we talked a lot, you know, through the first four lectures about about loads, right? And we talked about um, um, our zip models and how how loads do react to voltage. And if you remember from the constant impedance and constant current and, and constant power type of loads, uh, some of these would actually uh, uh, respond really well to reducing the voltage by by overall reducing the energy consumption that they have. So that's the theory behind this: is as you reduce the voltage. On, on a steady state basis, continuous basis, not just um, you know for a short period of time or temporary, uh, you should be able to see some reduction in overall energy. Unfortunately, it also reduces the income. It, do it does. <laughs> it does. We, we reduce our revenue. And I'll get the chance to talk a little bit about that as utilities, because the, the revenue model for utilities has probably changed as well to support these type of initiatives. So conservation voltage reduction, again, um, if you look at the ANSI range, ANSI range um, indicates the allowable delivery voltage to the end user. And this is for, for the, the, the figure you see there is 420 base. You know, other customers that use 240 and, and, and 480 have a different, different range, but I wanted to show this one because, you know, we relate to it fairly well as residential customers. So that one is 114 to 126 per the ANSI code. Illinois had to be different, and, and our code here is 113 to 127. So Amber and Illinois and ComEd have to, to meet that 113 to 127 uh, voltage range um, for, for our customers as a delivery voltage. Now, distribution utilities historically, like, like Professor Sauer said, used to operate in the upper 
range of that voltage, mainly around 125, 126. So if you go to any of our substations and you look at the voltage regulator or the LTC, they're most likely going to be set at 125 as a set point, and it's got a bandwidth plus and minus one. So it will range anywhere from 125 to 126 or 124 to 125. And the reason we do that is, is again, makes sense to, to bring this topic up, is because we talked about voltage reduction, uh, I'm sorry, voltage drop calculations. So on a distribution circuit, we talked about the impedance and, and how as far away you go from the substation, voltage tends to drop because of the impedance. Right? We want to protect and make sure our customers are nowhere near that lower end of the, of the allowable range. And we don't want to cause any violations. So to take a very, very conservative approach, we peg the voltage regulators and the LTCs as high as possible um, at the substation, at the feeder head. That's why mine is 128. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> that is a violation. <laughs> yeah, that's a violation, and, and we, we don't want to do that. But yes. Uh, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. Um, so, so yeah, we, we do that. Sometimes we're, like I said, we're at 125, and, and if the voltage regulator for some, some reason is acting a little bit weird, has got some kind of problem, you'll end up seeing violations easily uh, for customers that live right outside the substation. That they will see them, the largest uh, probably voltage magnitude out on the circuit. So that's one. Two, and you know, I don't claim this, and Amory Illinois does not claim this, but Utilities had that mentality of generating more revenue, so 125 and 126, larger voltage, larger energy consumption, kind of made sense. But today we're in the world of smart grid. We're in the world of efficiency. We're in the world of optimization. And we can't allow ourselves to do these kind of things, especially when we have the technology. We have sensors and we have AMI and we have all kinds of uh, data points available to us uh, to allow us to operate a little bit more, more optimal and in an efficient way. So back to CVR, the main idea is to maintain voltage delivered to the end customer in the lower portion of the acceptable range that's, that's up on the screen. So why CVR? Like I said, we're trying to reduce energy through steady state and, and continuous reduced voltage. Um, it also helps system losses overall. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the VAR component uh, in a bit. But that also helps reduce your overall system losses. Your transformer core and no load losses also get reduced when you reduce the, the voltage. We know that the, um, those are, are highly dependent on, on the voltage magnitude that you get at the transformer. Peak load demand, uh, we just were talking about energy storage and how that could help. Also, during peak load demand, if you're able to reduce the voltage, you could reduce that peak load demand and eventually reduce stress on, on equipment that you have on the, on the grid and on infrastructure. Now, when you maintain acceptable voltage at all points along the feeder, also you are trying your best to, to, sit, to stay uh, you know, out of violations, like I said. So you could correct any other voltage problems that you would see when you try to implement conservation voltage reduction. So for Professor Sauer's case, our engineers, if they're doing voltage optimization or conservation voltage reduction, they'll have to go study the circuit and find out that we're delivering high voltage at some points and then correct that. So. <laughs> we should find out about it. <laughs> we should find out about it. We have the tools, so uh, I'll, I'll get your circuit number afterwards, and maybe we can do something about it. And it is viewed as a painless EE measure for utilities and customers. And you know, to take a tangent on this just a little bit, when we say painless, most of our energy efficiency projects have been directly in contact with the customer. So I have to go to Jeff and say, "Hey, Jeff." You know, if you have an old, inefficient refrigerator, I'll come give you 50 bucks and give it to me. That was our approach to energy efficiency. Light bulbs, we'll go subsidize that. We'll give money to the large manufacturers of light bulbs and, and go get those ones out in the market for cheap so customers will go buy energy efficient light bulbs. So again, a lot of these methods had to use third parties and had to use direct contact with the customer. Might have not been the best way to do energy efficiency. When you do this, on a, when you do conservation voltage reduction or voltage optimization on the, on the entire feeder that you control and you have full, uh, full capability of managing, then becomes an easier process for the utility and the customer as well. Here's a figure. I, I used something similar to this in, in the last slide when we're talking about voltage drop calculations. But this shows uh, you know, a typical feeder. Um, I borrowed this from an EPRI uh, report. This shows 122 at the feeder head. So um, at, at the substation, it doesn't show what we typically have, 125 or 126, but shows 122. 
and shows you as you go away from the distribution uh, substation or from the feeder head how the voltage gets uh, gets reduced. Uh, the two volt drop or the three volt drop on the primary uh, from 122 to 119, that, that's mainly for that impedance on, on the lines and the conductors that we've talked about. Remember, the transformers have also a voltage drop across them. So typically, you know, the rule of thumb actually for design engineers is that there's a two volt drop across the transformer uh, distribution delivery transformer that you've got. Then you have a secondary uh, line and then you have a service drop. And the secondary is just, you know, from our first lecture, we talked about the overall distribution system. The secondary is that secondary network that runs um, single phase laterals um, to the homes. And we also have that service that goes from the distribution transformer to your house. It's probably a small wire sometimes you see in backyards. That also has a voltage drop. So if you look, two volts across the transformer, one volt for the secondary and one volt for the service, that's about four volt drop. Uh, right there as near as, as, as it can be to the customer itself and leaves us a little bit of a drop for the primary uh, before you start getting into that violation range. So we're talking about maybe a, a five, uh, I'm sorry, uh, maybe a six to seven voltage uh, uh, points or, 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 or volts that you can drop across the system easily um, before you start seeing any any violations. Here's another one, another one that we use at Ameren when we go around and, and train our engineers and, and our folks about what voltage reduction is. Uh, the previous one had an LTC at the, at the feeder head, a load tap changer. LTC, as, we, as we've discussed, uh, it controls all the feeders coming out of the substation. So if I had multiple feeders, it controls the voltage for the entire bus. A voltage regulator tends to control specific or individual feeders. So if I have multiple feeders coming out of the substations, each will have its own voltage regulator. It just gives me a little bit more control over the voltage per feeder. We also talked last time, or, or early on in the class, we talked about having voltage regulators out on the line. Take a look at what we are seeing here. So the gray is your typical voltage coming out of the substation again. And, and it starts dropping because this probably is a very long feeder that we've got here. So because of impedance, it drops. The utility here decided to add another voltage regulator in the middle of the feeder to boost the voltage up so you make sure that this last customer never sees a violation, right? If I didn't have this voltage regulator, I most likely would have seen some violations here for these customers because they're really, really far away from the substation. So one way to remedy that is to add another voltage regulator in line to help with these customers boost the voltage. Here you see that voltage reduction. So the gray line, again, is, is what you get without any voltage re reduction. And then you see that you can have levels of voltage reduction. I can go to the blue one, reduce the voltage a little bit. I can go to orange and truly reduce the voltage quite a bit. So that's what we're really targeting when we're saying conservation voltage reduction, is drop that voltage profile as much as we can without causing any violations to the customer. Can't you just put some capacitors on the line? Very good question. We can. Take a look at those. So this is just very basic, you know, just a constant impedance load. That I wanted to throw that out there. Um, take a look at, at, at how this behaves against voltage. So this is watts and this is volts. So we started, this was a bench test that was done uh, by actually, I mentioned it last time, Richard McQuan was part of this paper that, um, that was published when he was working for Con Ed. Um, but they've tested multiple devices, lab tested them for voltage and, and, and reaction to, or, or I'm sorry, for, for energy and, and power and how that reacts to voltage um, uh, delivery. So here you see the voltage. As the voltage rises, that, that power increases. So at 125, it's using somewhere around, uh, I think, 80, 80 watts. But at 120, it's using something like 70 watts. So you see how, how this... Um, incandescent light bulb um, reacts to increase in voltage. Across the, across the country, folks that have piloted voltage optimization have seen anywhere from one and a half to two percent energy reduction all across their system. We'll talk about how you end up calculating some of that stuff. So everything we talked about, or I talked about right now, was all about reducing the voltage, and we didn't talk much about VARs. Like Professor Sauer talked about cap banks. So VAR also is, is, is a big component of conservation voltage reduction or, or voltage optimization. That's why we started naming it 
volt var optimization because you're optimizing the voltage and the vars to deliver maximum results to to your system and to your customers so voltage and var tightly related of course uh, increasing or decreasing var flow would impact voltage also var control plays a big role again uh, in, in improving power factor minimizing losses and, and helping capacity all across the distribution feeder so to, to control the voltage and to control the vars um, the the optimal way to implement these type of projects is to use again like i said smart grid type technology so this is a feeder um, or a typical distribution feeder. Talked about the, the substation, capacitors along the line, voltage regulators along the line. Sometimes you might need some sensing to figure out, okay, what is the voltage exactly doing in real time? So a lot of people use conservation voltage reduction where they would set the voltage and forget about it. So they would go set the voltage at the substation lower, so maybe 120 instead of 125, see that you don't have any violations or study that, and then go home and, and never tweak it again. To really get optimal results, you really need more of a real-time operation. So every hour, every 15 minutes, if you can figure out what the voltages are, figure out what the best setting for the voltage could be at the feeder head and what the positions of the voltage regulators and cap banks along the feeder should be to deliver maximum results, that truly is the best way to operate a program, right? I don't want to go set something and forget about it when I can actually achieve more savings you know, in real time. Big component for that is AMI. Remember, we talked about loads and we talked about different different ways to bring back load information. AMI, advanced meter infrastructure, is one great way to do it. So those are meters that are at the at the customer premise. Typically, they bring back KW and KWH information for billing, but a lot of them have the capability of bringing back voltage current, temperature, all kinds of information that are really, really useful for programs like this. So at Ameren, our voltage optimization program uses AMI as a core component of the program. So every 15 minutes, we go out and ping the customer meters to figure out what the voltage is. And we feed that back into a central algorithm that decides, okay, if the voltage here is, for example, uh, able to be reduced, right? Then the the system is going to send new settings to all my voltage regulators and cap banks and and achieve that savings, achieve that reduction in voltage. Then it's going to go back and again it's a it's a feedback loop or closed feedback loop. It's going to go back and check the AMI one more time after that reduction, and see do I have any violations? If no violations, it's probably going to come back and see what else can I do? Can I reduce the voltage more, as long as I don't see any violations and continue to achieve savings. Does that make sense? AMI, again, is core piece to bringing that feedback of what the voltage is doing at the end customer. I listed here just the different equipment that we use as part of infrastructure for voltage optimization, LTCs and voltage regulators, line voltage regulators, capacitors, AMI meters, and then our SCADA system that brings back all that information, compiles that information, and gives it uh, the intelligence to figure out what do I need to do, what my voltage should be all across the circuit in real time. I figured we can take a look at an actual circuit with actual data to see how actually I can achieve voltage optimization or, con or conservation voltage reduction on a feeder. Here, here's, a, here's a circuit. I got an LTC. This is a transformer with an LTC, low tap changer that can change the voltage on. And then I got three capacitor banks along the feeder. My measurements before doing anything to the capacitors or to the voltage regulator are listed there. So that's P for me, that's power in real time, KW. That's Q, that's my VAR component. That's the power factor in real time. And these are my losses. If I want to start looking at, at optimizing my system, the, typically, the voltage optimization algorithms tries to play with cap banks first to try to what we call flatten the voltage profile. How do you increase the In here? Yeah. So, it's kind of tricky, isn't it? Mm, not very. No? <laughs> not very tricky. Uh, here, we, we, we run the load flow in real time to calculate the losses. So you would, oh, you mean from a 
power flow, you would know what the loads were. Correct. And then you just compute the sending power. And that's Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So this actually here is is uh, the the P and the Q are in real time. So I bring those back in real time. The power factor and the losses are calculated based on a load flow that uses that real time information and what I have in terms of loading on the on but the. The loads are not. They're not. No, they'll be forecasted, or they'll be they'll be allocated so along the feeder. Yeah, they're calculated. The way we call them is we we say it's calculated. So yeah, there'll be some error factor in there. Well, you could you could measure the load and send that back also. You could, absolutely. Where? Right, so this is without AMI. This is just a basic view of how we do this without AMI. Using AMI, I would, absolutely, because I'm bringing back 15 minute intervals that will bring back the KW, KWH, and voltage, so I can calculate that in real time. Correct. Not for this, not for this example here, though. Using the power factor, you can calculate the receiving of power. This is the power injection, so the difference between two can be considered as well for that specific instance. Yeah, it's at, it's at the feeder head. Oh, okay. So, but you'll be knowing the power factor uh, at the load, right? How would you know that? You could. Technology today would allow you to bring back power factor, but... You can get it from the load flow. You yeah. could, right. You could. And that's how we calculated it here again. The power factor here and the losses here are calculated based on load flow. But this power factor right here is at the sending Correct. And again, we have the capability of having power factor and losses calculated at the at the nodes at the customers because of AMI and then aggregate all that back to the feeder head we have that capability we just again for this example we didn't do it so so what we're trying to target here is again efficiencies at the feeder head so I want to minimize my losses I want to fix my power factor get it as close as unity as possible and then flatten the voltage profile so I can reduce it as much as I can. Right now, I can't reduce this voltage profile. If I, if I ask this voltage regulator or the LTC here to reduce voltage, I'm going to go into a violation, right? So if I reduce the voltage at the feeder head, it's going to end up reducing this voltage at this, at this last node, and I'm going to cause a violation. So I really can't do any conservation voltage reduction for the existing voltage profile that I've got. So I'm going to utilize these cap banks to try to flatten the voltage profile, improve my power factor and my losses, then reduce the voltage to achieve energy savings. Here's the first attempt at it. So as soon as I close that cap bank towards the end, notice what happened to my KVAR. KVAR absorption went, went less, right? My power factor improved and my losses improved. Went from 96 kW to 91 best part about it is also my voltage profile went up. Remember, as I add virus to the system, I'm improving the voltage, I'm increasing the voltage. So the voltage here, right at that node, went up. Oh. I just lost my clicker. You're making more money. Say that again? Plus, you're making more yes, money. Yes, yes. Did you notice that the power went up? The real power. The real power, yep. Power went up, exactly. And the, and the reason that happened, right, because I reduced my losses, and then some of my loads, because I reduced the losses, are going to consume more, more energy. So power actually went up. Well, you know, really don't make more money because I still said, like, the whole purpose of putting the, uh, putting the voltage curve and putting the load is the end of optimization. You, we'll, 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 that, yes, right? we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. So as you do this, to get to a place where you can reduce the voltage, you will have to compromise and, and give back or, or earn more energy. Here's my second cap bank. So my second cap bank just closed, same thing. I improved the power factor, went from 0.97 to 0.98. Losses got reduced. VAR flow got better. Voltage profile went up. So again, the dotted line was my very first um, original case. Second dotted line is when I closed the cap bank. And now I improved a little bit more. And here I am, I closed my third cap bank. Again, power factor improved, losses were reduced, and my overall VAR flow reduced to have a much better voltage profile here. Right? So I closed all three cap banks, did really well on losses and VARs, 
and power factor, power went up, but now it allows me to reduce the voltage as much as possible to bring back that, that power down. So now I reduce the voltage by one increment, right? So reduce the voltage by, by this, this much, and that brought back my overall power. And then I can reduce it even more, again, to stay within my threshold without causing any violations. I can bring it back a little bit more and reduce power even, even more. Now, if I run this 24-7 at a reduced voltage profile, the assumption is I'm going to be able to save more and more energy in real time. So in aggregate, I'm going to be able to use uh, to save a lot more energy for the customers. The power factor went up, didn't it? It did. Yep. <clears throat> so that, how significant is that increase in the power factor? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, again, in, not very significant. Also, the losses, all the losses, all the losses are very, very small, right? I mean, we went from 96 in the original case to 88, I think, to the last case. So even that is is not very significant in the grand scheme of things. But still, they are savings for the overall, you know, solution. So we take into account the losses and, and the energy reduction all together as a as a final set of of, of savings for the for the circuit and for the customer. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Now remember, what we did here, we would be able to do using an algorithm with that feedback loop from AMI to do that in real time. So in the olden days, we used to do it once, we set it, and we forget it based on a study. right? Because now I have feedback, and I can go back and get all these voltages from the end points, I run this exact same analogy in 15 minutes using algorithms and, and software based uh, solutions to do this in real time and achieve as much as possible savings and improvement to my power factor and losses. How do you determine how many caps, like in this example you're using three caps, right? mm -hmm. how do you determine that you, like, you can get the job done at two cap banks or four cap banks? How do you determine the number of Yeah, that's a great question. So this circuit have, happened to have those three cap banks. So I didn't have to go and, and add additional capacitors to the circuit becomes a cost benefit analysis. If I want to add a cap bank, what am I trying to achieve? Right? If if I think I can do the job with these three cap banks, meaning I can achieve my unity power factor, I can achieve a, a decent VAR flow, and I can reduce my losses with three cap banks, then it's good. So the way we do this is we use software and we start adding more cap banks and figuring out what my benefits are, compare those to the cost of what does it cost to put a cap bank and see if it makes sense. Is that a place in cap banks, you mean, or yeah, it's a study. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's 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 a it's an element of of this entire program. So every circuit we study to figure out if I need a, to add a cap bank, what does that mean for my overall benefits? And if I need to, does it make sense to go invest in adding a cap bank? <clears throat> yep. Sometimes you might need to move existing cap banks too, right, to get an optimal solution. So you might have three, but they're not optimally placed. So you can move them around too. Same thing. You would be doing the same exact type of analysis, but using power flow. So we'd run the model, change the cap bank location, different places, and see what the results are. That's what our that's what our engineers do. Do they just change the location? Like you need to change the location of the cap bank, right? How do you change like where to put it? Like you can't just describe an error. No, you don't. So the software has what we call packages called capacitor placement package. And when you run that package, it is actually doing the optimization for you and where the optimal placement of a cap bank should be. Can you no, no. Ours is Synergy is what we showed you last time. And pretty much every power analysis software that I know has a cap placement module in it. Could be trial and error. It's iteration, yeah. So like yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yep, yep. So, so what we talked about so far is how do you implement it, examples of conservation voltage reduction. One of the bigger challenges with this is how do you actually calculate the, the savings uh, that you can achieve with con conservation voltage reduction. I, I'll never forget, I sat in front, of a, in front of a commission staff once. And he asked me, he said, you know, okay, you do this and, and you save energy. In real time, you probably can calculate it. But how do, how do you actually uh, calculate the savings for the customer? So if I am at home, how do you actually measure the savings for me? 
What if I was gone on vacation for a week? I didn't use any of the energy, right? How could you attribute that to me, you know, not using energy versus your program that's trying to achieve energy reduction for the, for the feeder? So, so we'll walk through a couple examples of what the industry does today to try to calculate um, the overall savings uh, in terms of energy for conservation voltage reduction and, and voltage optimization. Yeah? I know, like, not in distribution, but in transmission systems, the ISO has a, something similar to known as upliftment saving, uh, which is a lost cost of energy to a generator. Uh, does that translate to distribution system to some, something like, I was at home, I didn't use it, that's a lost cost of opportunity for me. Are you going to reimburse me for that by doing a side payment? I have no idea what that is on the transmission side, so I'm not sure if that if that could translate, you know, to the distribution system or not. I doubt it, um, just because, um, again, today you, the appliances you have at home can can probably fall under the same under the same uh, concept. So if I don't turn my oven on that day, is that because again you you didn't you know you didn't use it or because I was reducing my overall voltage delivery point to you. So, so, so calculating the savings of what you're doing inside the house versus the system that's trying to operate is a little bit tricky. Um, maybe with AMI one day we'll be able to capture all that because now I'm, I'm measuring exactly how much energy you're using and I know the voltage that was delivered to you at that point. So maybe, maybe there, is, there is some advancements that can happen. Uh, but to us, we're, we're thinking more of a broader perspective. I want to measure the savings on a circuit for eight, seven, sixty hours of the year for 15 years. So I want to have a systematic way of, of doing it, and you'll see what, what type of logic we use here in a bit. So one of the core um, uh, terminologies um, that, that are out there when we're talking about conservation voltage reduction and voltage optimization is called the CVR factor. And the CVR factor is, is a way for us to, to understand or to gauge the sensitivity of the load to voltage, right? So if you look at the formula there, it's percent change in power to percent change in voltage. So all I'm trying to gauge there is how power changes as I change voltage. KWH saved, if I want to measure my savings in energy, a formula suggested is the change in voltage or percent change in voltage multiplied by that CVR factor multiplied by the average load that you're trying to save. In Illinois, that's the formula that we use on feeders when we're trying to calculate the savings. So I look at the average loading before voltage optimization. And then I take the percent change of after voltage versus before voltage. So after I start reducing the voltage, the delta, multiply it by that CVR factor, that sensitivity, sensitivity factor that's unique to that circuit. Right? Every CVR factor is going to be different. One circuit could have more residential than industrial. So the type of loads that you have on one circuit could be different. So the overall sensitivity of load to voltage on one circuit could be completely different than the other. That's not kilowatt hours, that's kilowatts from the line, isn't it? This right here? Uh, yeah, but on the right you don't have that. I have KWH here. Oh, there it is. Yep. 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 So this could be megawatts and if I use if I use peak demand here, for example. So yeah. No, that was kilowatt hours. Yep. That's that's over a year or something? Yeah, typically it's over a year. Yeah, actually the commission asked us to use the baseline for this to be years 2014 to 2016. So everything we do is based on those four years in terms of in terms of calculation. I went out and, and kind of looked at what other utilities have done in terms of their pilots and what CVR factors they've seen across their circuits. And these are just a, just a glimpse of, of those. And, and you can see the range widely, uh, with an average of all these being 0 0.8. So what does a, Z, uh, what is a CVR factor of 0 0.8 mean? It means that 1% change in voltage is going to reduce power by 0 0.8. So 
So on some feeders in California, they found out it's 0.75. Some feeders in New York, it's 0.6. And again, these are all dependent on what type of feeders they piloted and they did the studies on. The rule of thumb is one, more or less. Right, more or less, right? 1% change in voltage gives you a 1, 1, 1 reduction, reduction in power. power. Yep. At Amron, we actually, and, and again, this is just, just a mere coincidence, our pilot on the first five feeders that we implemented voltage optimization on was 0 0.8. So it just it just fit well with what the average across the nation was doing, and, and we had 0 0.8 as well on our pilot. So. so we talked about how do you measure the energy savings. We looked at the formula, talked about CVR factor being a key component to the calculation, right? Because that tells me what the circuit is, is doing and what the loads on the circuits look like. Here is, here is a, a, a figure that shows the normal mode versus reduced mode in terms of, in terms of power. And you can tell from the colors really well on the, on the projector here, but green is, is the one that, that's a little bit slightly higher than the red. So you can see that there is a difference between the, the power when I am in, in normal mode versus reduced mode. One of the best ways that the industry has, has come up with to try to measure the energy savings is to do on-off analysis. This, this part of what we will see here in Green Circuits Report and what we call Protocol 1 as well, is to do on-off analysis, CVR on or VVO on, CVR off or VVO off. The idea here is to compare the days that you're on versus the days that you are off. And if you do it long enough, you will have a large sample that would truly tell you how your circuit could or would behave uh, in response to CVR. And that's where you can start calculating that CVR factor, because now you can, you can gauge that sensitivity of your load to that voltage reduction. Here's an example of actual circuit across a number of hours where we had CVR on and then CVR was off. Pink was on, dark blue was off, and you can see that the variation looked look reasonable and you can, you can see the expectation here that the power was reduced overall. This is pretty neat, right? That's because it just happened that we have a good candidate circuit that we tested it on. Another circuit could have, could have really weird results, especially if you have outages, if you have large fluctuations in, in temperature that year or in that area, seasonal loads, right? Uh, if you have any, any missing data or any zeros in the data, you could end up with something like this. So the idea is to do on-off testing while you still normalize for a lot of these fluctuations that could occur on a circuit. These are the two main protocols that are used today to try to measure the savings for VVO on, on a given circuit. First of all, of course, you have always got to get rid of the bad data, right? So if you have zeros in the data, days that you didn't bring back voltage information or your system failed, communication failed to the devices, you got to get rid of that. You're going to try your best to normalize, right, for day-to-day -day changes. Again, weather and temperature and other random load behaviors. Protocol 1 says I can use a basic linear regression, right, and get some coefficients for heating degree hours and cooling degree hours because these are the most impactful to your, to your load. Just, just one school of thinking. I actually went back you know, just before I came to class and looked at a feeder that we have and I looked at 8760 megawatts and then I went back and got every hour of, of temperature data from a nearby airport and had a correlation of 0.98. Very tightly correlated is temperature to the, to the megawatts that were actually measured on that feeder. So this does have truth to it. Go ahead. That 8760? Yes. That's hours per year? That's hours per year, yep. 8760, yep. Okay. Another way to do it, which what EPRI was suggesting in their Green Circuits report, is probably use a different approach. And if you don't want to have to, to worry about the heating degrees and cooling degrees and all kinds of weekends and weekdays and all kinds of other variables that might have to go into this linear regression formula, you can go pick a comparable circuit. Circuit that looks a lot like the circuit that you're studying probably in the same geographic area, right? So if you have a substation that's feeding three, three or four circuits, 
two of them could be very, very, very fairly related and similar to each other. One could be a comparable circuit, and one could be a circuit that you're doing the actual testing on. Right? And do a linear regression on that, where you are using the comparable circuit as a baseline, and also make sure that you're including the voltage change right, as, as part of your variable. So if I have voltage reduction on versus voltage reduction off, would be one of those, one of those variables. Does this make sense in a way to actually try to capture that sensitivity and try to capture the, the, the change in the behavior of the load? That's, I know it's almost time, but that's what I, I wanted to, to cover around voltage reduction and, and voltage optimization this, today. Go ahead. This is voltage on or off, so it's a one or a zero? One or a zero, correct. <clears throat> this is voltage reduction on versus voltage reduction off. K2 must be some nominal sensitivity? K2 will, will be a calcul. This, this is what you will calculate, yeah, I mean. Um, th this this will be the sensitivity exactly. This will be the sensitivity to voltage change. Isn't that point eight from the That's the point eight, and this could vary, like I said, from circuit to circuit. For us, it would have been the point eight, correct? Yeah. Now. What, what do you mean by voltage zero or one? So here, voltage normal is one, zero is reduced voltage. So when I drop the voltage for that period of time, oh, okay. I indicate it by a zero. To see what the effect is. Correct. To see the change in state. Reduced voltage versus versus normal voltage. Now, again, this could be a little tricky because you know the reduced voltage, depending on the hour of the day, you might not be able to reduce the voltage much. Right? Sometimes you could reduce it really, 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 really far. You could go five percent, six percent voltage reduction. So anyway, it's a good way to still capture the change in voltage. Our vendor that is uh, operating uh, some pilot circuits for VO today has this as the way of measuring the savings. Other vendor, you know, we, we're right now piloting three different vendors, so two of them are actually using this protocol one, and one is using the green circuits. So we'll see what they end up with in terms of CVR factors, and then we'll try to compare them to our own calculations as well. Uh, uh, every green circuit, what is that, a manual or a book? It's actually a study. Yeah, a study they used, um, I think, eight utilities where they went and, and piloted conservation voltage reduction on, and they compiled that in a report called it the Green Circuits Report. It's available online for free for folks to, to check it out. Another really good, um, and I should have probably put these references, another really Memory good... Memory doesn't usually give things for free. Unless it's outdated, yes, <laughs> yeah. This is, I think, is a 2010, maybe 2012 report, the EPRI Green Circuits report. The one that's really old uh, is a 1978 report that they actually tested uh, and, and bench tested um, the, the change in voltage uh, impact on different appliances and their consumption of energy. It's called the effect, it's called the impact of reduced voltage on, um, on electric loads. And it's a 1978 report, so it's two volumes. Pretty interesting. I, I got a chance to read it all, and pretty pretty cool stuff in it. Talks about motors. That was my favorite part: is how motors actually respond to change in voltage as they bench tested them, and they could have a negative effect. So so you could have reduced voltage that that uses less energy, and then as you reduce voltage too much, you could actually have a negative effect where you start consuming more energy. Um, so so just just some interesting stuff in the report as well. So I definitely. Recommend if you got time, take a look at it. One thing that I want to mention about this, and I just want to bring back the the circuit view here, that would impact negatively um, the the conservation voltage reduction that somebody might be trying to achieve is DER, and that's something that uh, that I tried to get the point across painfully to, to folks, and, and eventually they're starting to get it. Let's say I come in and add a, a DER here. So a two megawatt energy storage unit comes in, starts discharging on the system, right? Remember, as I start adding KW on the system here, right, I am going to end up raising the voltage a little bit on the circuit. And the and a lot of, a lot of the DERs also has a VAR 
component to them that they can start pushing VARs back on the system, raising the voltage. I've been trying to reduce the voltage all along from a feeder head perspective, and then some customers that probably start coming in on the circuit installing their DER could start raising the voltage. For 350 bucks. For 350 bucks, right. So, so they start negating some of the savings that I tried to do. One key technology that's going to um, help us out is the smart inverter. Smart inverter that gets installed on a DER could become part of this overall algorithm where you send it a command and say, hey, I want you to absorb VARs if I need you to absorb VARs, or push VARs in a certain time if I need you to push VARs, where it becomes more of a dynamic um, inverter that I can use to support my voltage optimization um, project. So I was thinking maybe next class, one of my employees can come in and talk to you about smart inverters, if that has any interest. Um, it's a pretty wide topic, and, and it's very very important to what we do today. Now we have a lot of DERs penetrating on our system. Um, we just set a specification for what that would be in Illinois, and we're trying to confirm also with 1547, which is which is the main standard for for inverters. But uh, if that's of interest, so I, I figured ask you guys, and if you're interested, I can I can bring in one of my engineers and talk about it. Make sense? Sure. Cool. Very nice, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll do that.